Hello everyone, my name is Stevie Swan and this is the class Introduction to Manga Studies. Now, when we think of manga, we have to acknowledge that manga's medium is comics, and there are many different comics cultures around the world. Now, among the most popular and widespread that we see are the American superhero comics, as well as what we think of as Japanese manga, and Western European bandesine. Now, American superhero comics, which we see on the left, have its own set of conventions and images, imaging styles, as does Japanese manga, which we see here in black and white with its own conventions of things like impact lines, as well as European bandesine, which in this particular image of Tintin, is its own types of conventions and patterns. Now, broadly, when we think of comics, we tend to think of uh, uh, comics as a medium that uses panels, using pictures and words that come together. Now, they have a narrative as well as characters, and these are the things that we often tend to focus on. But the question is, how do we read comics? In other words, is it something that is natural or is it something that is learned? Given the diversity of the types of conventions that we are showing just here in the images of the three different larger spheres of comic cultures, we can already see that there are slight differences between them that might not immediately appear to us as something that we can uh, uh, consider as naturalized to that location of the world because we can learn to read it. Now, because this class is going to be mainly focusing on manga instead of all comics in general, uh, we might have to consider that manga is not so easy to just say, this is manga, and have a very neat definition of it. In fact, there are just a massive amounts of quantities of manga, different types, different styles, different genres, as well as readers. Can we understand this variety? What does it do for us? And do we read each of these different genres, for example, differently? What does this tell us about what we think of as Japanese culture, as well as Japanese society and consumption patterns? Moreover, what does this diversity, as well as the different things that are done in various manga, tell us about media in general? What about the fact that many of these, especially the ones that are shown here, are in fact quite popular outside of Japan, meaning that what could this tell us then about global culture? When we think about the type of variety of manga, we also have to consider that the Japanese manga industry has a very particular type of industry and distribution. Now, these are what's generally called industrial genres, which are serialized in magazines. Now, uh, I think these terms are going to be very common to you, but there's shonen, young boys manga, shoujo, young girls manga, seinen, which is young adult male manga, and jose, which is young adult women's manga. Now, these are just four of the larger categories uh, amongst of which there are many others, but this system is in fact something that has been going on since the 1970s. It begins around the 1950s, but it settles into the pattern that we know today from the 1970s onwards. So we might think not just about their history, but what are their differences? How have they in fact interacted? And because these are gendered and aged genres, what can they tell us about gender and age issues? What can they tell us about contemporary culture? And how do the patterns that distinguish each genre and gendered and aged genre from one another, how can these distinct patterns shape different views of the world? Moreover, if we're gonna think about manga studies, we might wanna think about some of the key figures of manga and its history. What were their legacies? Was it just creating famous characters or was there something more to their style that really shifted the world of manga after they became popular? Moreover, was it only that they were engaged in manga or did they work with other uh, issues such as dealing with things in the wider society or and engage and impact different media shifts. Now, when we talk about manga, as I did in the introduction to this, uh, uh, the introductory slide, we see that manga is often connected to Japan, usually to Japanese culture and a very particular visual culture. Often this is connected to ukiyo-e, such as hokusai's manga, and something that even goes back further than the Edo period into the 12th century, such as choju giga. Now, the question then becomes, well, if manga is connected to Japanese art history, what is its exact connection? 
Moreover, what about the name manga? Now, Hokusai's manga uses the kanji manga, but often manga is written in katakana as uh, in the contemporary era. Is there a difference between those? What are the nuances and histories of that? Moreover, outside of Japan, not just focusing on the local history, how does manga's actual history, both inside and outside of Japan, connect to other comic cultures? This is important to note because there is a very long history of what might be seen as manga or recognizably manga-esque made outside of Japan. This includes Korean manhwa and webtoons, as well as Chinese manhwa, original English language manga, as well as European manga, of which there is one being shown here, that was uh, recently made into a TV anime that was shown uh, around uh, not just Japan, but globally. Now, these manga, in fact, repeat and use many of the same elements we see in so-called Japanese manga. So what does that mean for manga from inside Japan? What about for global culture generally? Can we think of manga beyond just telling us about Japanese culture? Moreover, as I mentioned, even in the example of global manga for Radiant, uh, there are many manga that connect through and with anime. In fact, they are usually seen as a set, but in fact, when we examine them, are actually very different in some ways. Manga is comics and anime is animation in very simplistic terms. But it also means that they're made differently from different materials and have a very different process of distribution. So what are their points of overlap? How are they distinct? And what can that tell us about the contemporary world and the media of these particular objects? These material differences do have an impact on the way that manga itself has been published historically. Now, usually for many years, manga was published in magazines in weekly installments and then brought together in tankobong singular books that were then sold. But now this paper-based publishing industry is uh, in a bit of a decline due to the internet. In fact, many manga are now distributed and made digitally. So what happens when manga is made digital? Is it simply the same thing? Well, at least on an experiential level, I think very simply we can grasp that opening a manga and flipping through the pages are quite different than scrolling through it on a phone or an iPad or looking at it on a computer. So what changes in that process? What about the way that people make it? What about the way that paneling works or the way that color may work in manga? On top of that, what happens to the stories or the narratives? Are there other changes that occur in manga, especially when manga is made from uh, uh, right from the beginning as a digital product, or when it is converted from paper product into digital, or when digital gets converted into paper? So what happens in these processes? What happens with digitalization? Now, this is an issue that isn't necessarily isolated to manga as the digitalization of not just necessarily uh, manga and media, but also daily life activities. Some of them, including something like a class like this, is something that is happening all around us at a very rapid pace. So manga gives us an opportunity to think about it uh, with this specific example. So these are some of the questions that manga studies can help us engage with. So each week, what we'll be doing in this class is examining a different approach to manga studies. We'll be building off of previous weeks, piece by piece, learning new ways to think about a variety of topics. And through this, we'll be addressing issues that go beyond just manga, engaging with other fields and other disciplines. So in this way, what we'll be doing across the semester is using manga studies as a way to explore different perspectives on the world. Now, one of the reasons that this class takes the form and the structure that it does is not just to learn some information, but to provide tools to help you think and organize your thoughts. Now, as many of you are clearly aware, given the contemporary crisis and pandemic, we live in an age of information, one where we have more access to information at more times at an easier speed and, and cost than we ever have before. But because of this, there is an, more, there's an overabundance of information, and we might want to know how do we deal with it. 
And this, as a humanities class, is, very, is going to utilize the tools built from the humanities to help analyze that information. Because the humanities, over many, many uh, uh, centuries, have developed quite a number of, uh, uh, of skilled and precise ways of examining information, as well as the terms to understand it. One of those would be, how do you know you know what you know? Now, this seems like a very complex, confusing question at first, but the basic premise of this is to say, well, let's decide on what information is relevant and how do you decide on that and for what purpose? Moreover, once you've decided on that, how do you interpret this information? What methods do you use, not just to procure or to get information, but to uh, make use of it? In terms of making use of it, there are ways that the humanities uh, have developed to help make connections across disciplines, across subjects, and to help create new concepts to inform different ways of understanding the world, to help you see multiple perspectives at once. In particular, this is all aimed at providing you the skills to be able to articulate yourself, the way to give you an improvement in the ability to express your ideas and your concerns. And often this will help you in issues that are very pressing at any moment in time, but uh, in particular in moments like this, such as ethics. Why do you feel a certain way about a particular subject? And what is the history of that subject? What is the connection of that to other things that may initially feel or seem dis distant, but in fact are connected? Moreover, is there a different way to see it? Can we see it from a new perspective that might change the way that we could act or feel about the world around us? So this semester is uh, a bit different than most semesters, as you all know. And due to the online format, um, I will be utilizing uh, whatever uh, digital tools I can to help aid in the teaching process. So the general structure for this class will be as follows. Um, each week there will be a reading uh, that is uploaded to Hopi. Um, and I expect you to have read that reading before the next class. Now, the way that I use readings in my classes are usually in reference to the lectures. So the lectures will do one of three things. Um, sometimes I'll go over the reading in detail. Uh, this is when I think it would benefit uh, uh, you if I went through each point, point by point. Um, sometimes I'll be drawing in other materials or connecting it to earlier parts of the semester, other classes, other topics we've been talking about, and explaining it in ways that tie into our larger themes of the class. Other times I'll only use a small part of the reading in the lecture, so um, it'll be talking about other topics, but I'll have expected you to understand that particular part of the reading and how it connects to the broader uh, uh, themes of that particular reading, and I'll be then connecting it to the topic that we're discussing in class, which might be different than the reading itself, and as well as other themes we've been talking about in class. And then the third way that I'll be using readings is as background knowledge. So this is something that I will have expected you to know before you watch the lectures so that um, I can presume that you understand this information and I can build off of it to uh, help explain the topic that we'll be talking about this week. Now, all the lectures will be occurring on Zoom. I think it's a way that we can connect and interact. And should you have questions, we can contact, uh, uh, discuss things in real time. Um, I'll be keeping those lectures relatively short and we'll be using Zoom uh, to be having a lot of discussions and doing different activities. Now, uh, these discussions will happen and activities will happen either in a large group as a class or I will put you into Zoom breakout rooms where uh, each of you will be in small groups and I'll pop into each room and answer questions and provide comments where needed. And uh, then we might get back together and after you've prepared, uh, we, uh, in your small groups, we can have a much larger discussion as a class. Now, these discussions will be the basis for very short uh, responses, uh, participation uh, credits that I will 
uh, expect from you each week. Now these can be around 300 words. I'm not very particular if you have to hit exactly 300 words. It could be a little bit less, it could be a little bit more. And these will be based off of the discussion questions that we've had, and you can use the ideas that we talked about in class to help uh, uh, produce these participation uh, uh, assignments each week. Now, um, I'm assigning these because I would like to give people the opportunity to participate in as many ways as they can. Um, I understand that everybody's situation is uh, slightly different. So um, some people may not have the opportunity to speak up as much uh, over the Zoom sessions and other people may have technical difficulties uh, at certain times and not be able to participate that day or not be able to access it for whatever reason uh, there is. Other times people may feel more comfortable about typing out their responses, providing written participation rather than spoken participation. So considering that everybody has a different circumstance now, um, I think these assignments are a good way that we can all have a different as many opportunities to participate as possible in this class. Now the readings as well as the discussions slash assignments can all be utilized to help uh, in the final essay. Now this will be given at late, more information about this will be given later on in the semester, but uh, this essay will be due at the end of the semester after all classes are finished and you will have, you can upload that to Hopi. I'll give more detailed information on that later on in the semester uh, once we've covered a number of topics to then give the proper essay assignment. So for next week, please do the assigned reading. Um, please also prepare one or two manga that you like. Um, it can be a magazine or tankobon or digital format. Any of those are fine, but we're going to be using it in our discussions and the writing assignment for the next week that we meet. So as a discussion question for this class, I'd like you to answer the following question. Are manga different from comics? Why or why not? how and in what ways. Now, I know that this is just the first class, but I'd like you to try to answer that question with whatever ideas and impressions you have of manga at the current moment. And this will not only be a point of departure for us to think about manga as a particular type of media, but also a point for which we might look back to at the end of this class for when your opinions or views on manga may have changed and something to compare to, uh, to think about and consider as we uh, build our understanding of manga and manga studies. Thank you.